Hello and welcome to the second lecture on Look Back in Anger in this course on gender and literature which we are doing at the moment. So, in the first lecture, I will give you a background of the cultural conditions, the political conditions of the times. So, what were the conditions which produced this discontent, this anger that we see in the play? So, why is the protagonist so angry and what is the sort of very gendered uh, sort of locations in Look Back in Anger? So, I will give you an idea of the 1944 Education Act, the Swiss Canal Crisis, <coughs> the end of imperialism for England and how all these things sort of came together in order to sort of, you know, generate the idea of emasculation. So, England as a nation was getting increasingly emasculated. Uh, its authority was getting more and more questionable in a global political scenario. And so, the two big global players in politics which were emerging post Second World War were the USSR and the USA. Uh, so, the Cold War was brewing uh, and England really didn't have much of an agency, much of a position over there. And obviously, I talked also about uh, the presence of India uh, the very spectral presence of colonial India in Look Back in Anger, uh, as that colonial legacy which doesn't sort of go away, but it sort of haunts the English imagination with a combination of fondness, romance and guilt. And of course, with cynicism, as we see in the case of Jimmy Porter, the protagonist, who is cynical and who is sort of, who looks at imperialism as some kind of a evil enterprise. And more importantly and more personally, he blames imperialism for the condition of England that he is suffering, that he's, he becomes the embodiment of the present suffering of England at that point of time. Uh, the joblessness, the unemployment, uh, the cynicism, the agencylessness, this, uh, this sort of experience of stagnation, of feeling stagnated uh, in the very uh, sort of claustrophobic setting that we see in Look Back in Anger. So, all these are deeply political. So, Jimmy Porter, the entire uh, action in Look Back in Anger, as I mentioned, uh, takes place inside the one room apartment uh, in Midlands, that is Jimmy Porter's residence. And very seldom do we see uh, any, any outdoor uh, example, any, any, any uh, interaction outside the setting. So, the setting, the, the, the entire, the, the closeness of the setting is reflective of the claustrophobia of the cultural condition of England at that point of time. So, it is sort of reflective of the political. So, it is interesting to see how the intimate and the political, the, the internal and external, the ideological and the neural, they are always uh, in, a, in an interplay with each other and look back in anger. That is something we saw even in shooting an elephant that also in Hall of Darkness to a great extent. Okay. So, again this is something we, we will keep doing and again the, the, the problem of space, the politics of space and speciality becomes very important in look back in anger. What kind of space is inhabited by the men? What kind of space is inhabit inhabited by the woman? So, we saw in, in the beginning of the play we called it a kitchen sink drama. So, the reason why it is kitchen sink is because it relies almost entirely on, on gritty realism, very dirty, gritty, messy realism which does not make, does not want to, does not attempt to make the scenario any more romantic than what it really is. So, there is no romance in Look Back in Anger, it is the death of a romance, death of the empire. Uh, so, it is entirely cynical and bitter and disillusioned and despairing. Now, what we will do in this particular lecture is we will continue with this uh, cultural study, but at the same time what we will do is we will look at the politics of effect, the politics of mood in Look Back in Anger. To, so, to what extent is mood political? To what extent is mood gendered? Uh, and this is interesting in, in especially in relation to the content of this particular course, gender and literature. So, we saw if you remember, we saw in uh, uh, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, how seemingly non-human uh, entities such as the river Congo, the river Thames, uh, the, the, the jungle in Congo. So, all these seemingly non-living entities, they are deeply gendered in certain political and ideological conditions. They become deeply gendered in certain conditions. So, we see in Look Back in Anger too, how certain kinds of emotions, certain kinds of uh, you know, effect become really gendered uh, in, in terms of the political condition of that particular play. <coughs> now, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, in the previous lecture, that this is a play by John Osborne you know, first performed and written in 1956. This is a play which ushered in what we now call the Angry Young Man Movement. So, in the very, the very movement's name, Angry Young Man, so it makes it sound very masculinist, it makes it sound as if it is a male thing. It is all about male agony, male anger, uh, male resentment, male dissolution, etc. And to a large extent that is true. So, the entire Angry Young Man Movement um, that was generated out of look back in anger was a political uh, sort of sentiment. So, it was a sentiment of political dissolution. So, you know, again, we are looking at the interface between politics and emotion, between the external and the internal. So, emotion is something which we normally regard as internal, something inside us, something neural, something generated out of the body, out of the physicality, out of this organicity of the body. But at the same time, it is determined and in turn determines the political condition around it. 
And that's why we define this, how we define embodiment. Embodiment is a constant navigation, this constant interplay between the internal and external, between the internal system and external environment. They're sort of constantly at play with each other. And that's how we define embodiment as a category. Now, when I say that I'll talk about the mood in Ludwig and Anger, and I'll talk about how the mood becomes deeply ideological, deeply political, and deeply gendered in Ludwig and Anger, the primary mood in Ludwig and Anger is that of resentment. Uh, despair, resentment, but anger. I mean, just uh, the very title of the play uh, contains the word anger, and that's the primary mood of the play, the primary sentiment of the play, and that is anger. Now, the, the reason uh, for why Jimmy Porter is angry, obviously, is there, there's a series of cultural and political reasons which I sort of touched upon, elucidated to a, uh, to a certain extent in the previous lecture. But just to come back to it, the anger and look back in anger is politically constructed, it's politically determined. It's anger which comes out of disillusionment. It's anger which comes out of despair and exhaustion and a feeling of being cheated. So in a very interesting sense, the entire anger of Lubbock in anger, the entire anger in, in, in Jimmy Porter, the protagonist in Lubbock in anger, makes him almost hysterical. And at one point of the play, uh, he actually mentions, he actually compares himself with a hysterical woman. So he says, am I mad? Am I mad shouting like a hysterical woman? You know, so you know. Again, we see, to a great extent, how hysteria, and this is something we talked about in a previous lecture, the, the lecture on the fly. We we talked about how hysteria was traditionally considered to be, conventionally considered to be, a female malady, uh, something which happens only to women because it comes from the womb. That was the stereotypical medical definition of hysteria. But of course, things began to change dramatically after the First World War. We talked a little bit about shell shock. We talked a little bit about how the entire experience of shell shock which happened after the First World War, it completely reconfigured this uh, medical understanding of nervous breakdown, uh, the medical understanding of hysteria, which is no longer limited to a female malady, but it actually branched out and became a more, a more common phenomenon. Right? So again, in Look Back in Anger, we find Jimmy Porter is, is sort of this close to becoming a hysterical woman. Right? So this entire idea of become hysterical, this is something which happens in Hamlet as well. And this is the reason why we keep comparing uh, Jimmy Porter with Hamlet. Uh, so both of them are on the verge of becoming hysterical. Both of them are they're aware of the hysterical nature, and that what that's what makes them even more misogynistic. They they fear the woman, they hate the woman, because you know they're threatened by the woman. They're threatened by the presence of the woman, and both of them have a very complex relationship with their mother. So Hamlet, as you know, has a very complex relationship with Gertrude. Uh, he has this sort of semi-erotic, uh, semi-indifferent, uh, semi-avert, uh, you know, semi-loathful relationship with his mother. Uh, and, and the same goes for Jimmy Porter as well. So he is someone who hates his mother. Uh, he's never really had a, a motherly protective presence, except his friend's mother, uh, Mrs. Tanner, who appears, and doesn't appear in the play, but he's a third person, she's a third person presence. Uh, we'll talk about it later. But you know, in a nutshell, he has had a very complex relationship of negligence and, and adherence. Uh, association, affiliation, and dissociation with the mother figure. And that's something which has informed his childhood imagination, that's something which has informed his child psychology, and something which has stayed with him forever. Uh, and also, we will explore the relationship Jimmy has had uh, historically with his father. So, the, the father-son relationship is very interesting and look back in anger, because Jimmy's father, as we get to know in the course of the play, uh, he was a soldier who went and fought uh, for the Spanish Civil War. So, he went, for, he went and fought for a cause. He went and fought in the Spanish Civil War against the fascist regime, against uh, the Franco regime. As, as you know, any history of Fran Spanish Civil War will tell you, uh, it was a war against fascism, but then in the end it just became a war between two fascists, between uh, two totalitarian dictators, because Stalin from Russia sent his army uh, to support the rebels, and then of course the rebels were sidelined, and it became a war between Stalin and Franco, which was essentially a war between two totalitarian dictators. So in the end, the entire idealism of left-wing liberation uh, was sort of, it disappeared. It vanished, it became the background. So it, it, the entire foreground became uh, a foreground of fascism and totalitarianism. Now, when you come to Jimmy Porter's father, so he is someone uh, who went and fought in the Spanish Civil War. And then, of course, he came back from the war completely broken, completely traumatized, and, and, and dying. So Jimmy Porter, at one point in the play, uh, talks about his childhood trauma of seeing his father die. So he, he mentions quite explicitly that he was someone, he was 10 years old at that time, and he was in his father's dead bed and he sort of treated him as best he could for 10 months. 
and he went on uh, and then uh, and of course his father had no one else around him his mother had left him uh, this is again one of the reasons why he resents his mother because he considers his mother to be fashionably left wing uh, she was all for good causes you know uh, and the causes for the marginalized provided they were the fashionable marginalized so she was never there for her own husband who went and fought in the spanish civil war and came back broken so Jimmy Porter's anger against the woman, Jimmy Porter's fear of the woman, Jimmy Porter's resentment against the woman had been fueled by the resentment he has had to his mother figure. And again, in this way, he is very, very uh, comparable to Hamlet, as we keep comparing the two characters very directly as well as uh, in Cedar's way. Now, uh, Jimmy Porter's father is a very important presence in Lubbock and Anger, it's a very important political presence in Lubbock and Anger, because he embodies the death of uh, idealism. So he went and fought in the Spanish Civil War, which was a war initially fought for a brave good cause. Right? And of course, as the war transpired, as the war went on, it was revealed increasingly that there was no really brave good cause. It just became increasingly a war between two dictators. So he came back from the war broken, not just physically, he was wounded in the war presumably, but also broken ideologically, broken emotionally. So the trauma he faces, which kills him essentially, is a trauma which is as much a phys physical injury as an emotional injury. And Jimmy Porter, who was 10 years old at the time, he would sit beside the deathbed of his father and listen to him speak about his life, about his idealism, about the death of idealism, etc. And that, he says, uh, really informed him. That is a, really gave him the knowledge about life and death, pain, agony, despair. So all these things. Okay? And that fueled his uh, aversion to his woman, his fear of the woman that he has throughout, he carries throughout him. Now, again, if you look at Jimmy Porter's father, uh, the emotions he embodies is that of despair, dissolution, and cynicism. So he, he's, he's a voice of a broken man. He's a voice of a dying man. Again, I, I use the word dying man, broken man, in sort of literal sense as well as a symbolic sense. So we just talked about uh, in, at the end of the fly by Kathleen Mansfield, this entire interplay between symbolism and you know, literal figure. So the boss in the Mansfield's fly is literally a man, as well as symbolically, an uh, order of masculinity, which is dying, which is on its way out. So in, in a, likewise, Jimmy Porter's father too uh, represents a, a character who is really Jimmy Porter's father, but also he represents a kind of masculinity which is you know which went which started off being idealistic, which started off being ideologically idealistic, uh, ideologically uh, you know correct, uh, but then ended up being dissolution uh, you know you know in a state of despair and obviously very very cynical. And this cynicism, this despair, this dissolutionment that he has you know throughout the play, you know uh, Jimmy Porter he, he sort of inherits that from his father. So again, we find how a very interesting gender relationship away, the father-son relationship in this particular case, uh, is, is sort of essential for the transference of emotions and moods in look back in anger. So the mood in look back in anger, the primary mood in look back in anger is that of cynicism, is that of you know, anger, is that of dissolution. And that particular mood is very, very male. It's about, it's about male dissolution, it's about male anger, it's about male cynicism, etc. And you know, likewise, as I just mentioned, it's also about male hysteria. So, you know, that is almost a contradiction in terms. But that's exactly what happens if you look back in anger. Jimmy Porter, in many instances in the play, comes very close. He, he's on the verge of acting like a hysteric woman. Uh, and that, again, uh, informs his emasculation, that informs his masculinity crisis, and that makes the play even more complex from the perspective of gender studies. Okay? So, you know, this, these are the primary things that we look at when we look at the mood in look back in anger. And the other mood in look back in anger, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, when we talk about the men and look back in anger, we have Jimmy Porter's father, uh, who represents or embodies the death of ideology, the death of idealism. We have Jimmy Porter, who is cynical, bitter, angry. Uh, you know, he's obviously very, very dissatisfied with the condition of England. And we have other characters, such as Hugh Tanner. In the Hugh Tanner, in Look Back in Anger, is the ultra left wing friend of Jimmy Porter, who never appears in the play, but is talked about. So there are these characters in Look Back in Anger, and we'll talk about this. This, this can be a potential assignment for you. Uh, the characters in Look Back in Anger, who are talked about in the play, who are third person presences because they're talked about, but they don't really appear in the play. Right? They don't really make a physical appearance in the play, but they're talked about endlessly, and so they become uh, a very important background presence in terms of uh, theatrical significance, political significance, as well as emotional significance in this entire map uh, in Look Back in Anger. Now, Hugh Tanner in Look Back in Anger is a character who doesn't appear in the play, but he's talked about you know, endlessly, and so he's sort of seen as some kind of a, an extreme extension 
of Jimmy Porter's cynicism and anger. So if Jimmy is angry and cynical, then he is even a more extreme version of Jimmy Porter. Now he doesn't appear in the play. And we get to know that he is someone who was so disillusioned with England, who was so disillusioned with the entire civilization of England, he left England and went to China to write a novel. Right? And he sort of, interestingly, before he left for China, he, he tells Jimmy that you know, England is gone because Dame Allison's mob is back. Now what is a Dame Allison's mob? Dame Allison over here is a very sarcastic address to Allison, uh, Jimmy's wife, Allison. Now when Hugh says Dame Allison's mob is back, what he actually means is the Imperial Brigade, which had been in India, had come back to England because empire has ended, and they'll come back uh, and they want to continue with a sense of entitlement, with a sense of privilege, with a sense of superiority, etc. And that becomes too much to take for someone like Hugh Tanner, who considers himself to be a left-wing, ultra-left-wing person. So he's all for the cause of the working class, he's all for the cause of the common man. So he let, leaves England and he goes to China to settle down there. I mean, we never get to know more about him, except for the fact the idea that he has and the perception we get in the play when we read about Hugh Tanner is that he is an ultra left wing person who is a friend of Jimmy Porter, uh, who is so disillusioned with the country that instead of staying there, he leaves the country. So, you know, there are all these men in Look Back in Anger. Uh, the other example of another kind of masculinity in Look Back in Anger is that of Nigel Redfern. The Nigel Redfern is the brother of Alison Redfern, so he's Jimmy's brother in law, in a way. Now, he embodies this the opposite of uh, in a Hugh Tanner. He embodies conservative, pro establishment, sense of entitlement. So he's someone who's born into wealth. He's someone who's born in a privileged family. So that's his only uh, ticket to success. And so he goes to a public school called Sandhurst, which is a military school where very rich people's kids go. And so he automatically, the moment he graduates from Sandhurst, the moment he comes out of Sandhurst, he automatically pushes uh, for a position in the parliament. And Jimmy says, you know, he talks about uh, Nigel in very derogatory terms, in very disparaging terms. And he says Nigel is sure to win uh, an, uh, maybe a position in parliament because he comes from wealth. And that's all he has, that's all it takes in order to get a position in parliament. So again, Nigel represents that kind of masculinity which is almost entirely informed by entitlement, privilege and wealth. And so it's not really uh, an, a system of meritocracy. So meritocracy is something which is secondary or even tertiary perhaps in the context of look back in anger. And instead what we have is an idea of nepotism, favoritism, entitlement, etc. So again, the, the, the anger Jimmy Porter has against someone like Allison, is, uh, someone like Nigel is deeply political. Because Nigel represents to Jimmy that he will never become. So Jimmy Porter with all his education, with all his intelligence, all his insight into life, etc. will never get to be in a real position of power. He'll always be an armchair intellectual, he'll always be a rhetorical intellectual, he'll always be a rhetorically political person, but because he'll never really have a real political agency, which, which is something that someone like Nigel would have automatically because he's born into wealth. So again, we find uh, that, you know, this is post-imperial England, but we, this is deeply, uh, you know, divided by class, deeply divided by wealth, deeply divided by money and position and privilege. So Jimmy Porter is someone from a working class background who by dint of his education, which is a bit of a freak that, the, you know, is a bit of an experiment that happened in England whereby free education was given to everyone. So that experiment produced someone like Jimmy Porter. But then of course, it's a monstrous order of production. Like the Frankensteinian monster, Jimmy Porter too becomes an unaccommodated man. So he's someone who gets educated, he's someone who has a university degree, but then he cannot really be middle class, he cannot really be upper class because he doesn't have a job. There is no job left in the economy, right? So he, he, he has to go back and do a working class man's job, which is running a sweet store in an open air market. But then of course, he has, he's someone who has been changed by education. So he can quote Shelley, he can quote Wordsworth, he can quote Shakespeare. Uh, but then of course, he has his intellectual capital, but that's all the capital that he does. And so again, uh, uh, the next point I'm going to talk about is the idea of education and look back in anger. So if you look at the language and look back in anger, if you look at Jimmy Porter's language, uh, you find that deeply, uh, he is very anxious to promote himself as an educated man. He's very, very anxious to promote himself as a university graduate. So his language is very metaphorical. His language is full of allusions, full of references, which are cultural, literally, uh, scholastic, uh, topical, political. So in other words, he is not someone who is a typical working class person uh, talking about something very, very mundane. 
He takes great pains not to appear mundane. He takes great pains not to appear, in, uh, you know, run of the mill. So he, he's someone who's quoting Shakespeare all the time. He's someone who's quoting Shelley all the time. He's someone who's quoting, who's referring to Emily Bronte all the time. So in other words, he's very anxious to show off and flaunt his um, education, his university degree. And that's something which is very important to look back in anger. And that is, again, very, very male. This entire male, the masculine aspiration to climb up in the social ladder, uh, to become educated, to become something of a, an, a, you know, a privileged position, is something of an anxiety Jimmy Porter carries with him all the time, carries in him all the time. But of course, that it doesn't produce any positive result because it doesn't really have any real agency. Because it doesn't really have any money, it doesn't have, have a real job, etc. So he's somewhere stuck between being purely working class and between purely middle class. He's, he's neither of these two. So he cannot go back and become a working class again because he has been changed by education. But neither can he be uh, a middle class because he doesn't really have the capital, the, the financial capital to become really middle class. He has the intellectual capital, but that's about it. He doesn't really have any financial capital which will really make him middle class and he doesn't have it. So you know, in that sense, he's somewhere stuck between the two. But again, coming back to the main topic of this lecture, the relationship between mood and gender and look back in anger. So we have cynicism, we have resentment, we have anger, we have disillusionment. So all these are very male emotions in look back in anger. Uh, and of course, the mood in look back in anger is sort of predominantly male. It's about the entire exhaustion of being a man, there's this entire uh, fear of being a man. So the entire idea of privilege is going away. Uh, and there's this fear of the woman, there's this misogyny that Jimmy Porter has, this very neurotic fear that he has of the woman, which is something that he carries throughout the play, and that's something he can never get out of. Now, the woman in Look Back in Anger, they appear more powerful, they appear more in control, they appear more, you know, agentic than the men in Look Back in Anger. So the first woman we see in Look Back in Anger, the very opening scene of the play, is that of, is, is Alison in a Porter, or Alison Redfern. So Alison Porter is the wife of Jimmy Porter, the daughter of Colonel Redfern. Now you, we see her, the first impression we get of her is that of elegance. So she is someone who sort of embodies effortless elegance. Now we get to know uh, the, the elegance of uh, Alison Redfern obviously is, a, is an inheritance of the legacy of the colonial imperial experience that she has had. Uh, so she is someone who was born in India, she is someone who grew up in India, she is someone who is used to privileges, who is used to a uh, sense of entitlement like her brother Nigel uh, and she is someone uh, who wants to carry on that sense of entitlement etc. But then of course the obvious question is why would someone like Alison marry Jimmy Porter? Why would someone like Alison fall for Jimmy Porter? Because Jimmy is nowhere even close to what uh, the kind of uh, you know, circles that she is used to. She, he's not nowhere even close to the kind of circles that she is used to you know, socializing with or you know, talking to or acquainted with. Now, we get to know at some point in the play uh, that Alison is talking to a friend, Helena, who is another character which we'll talk about uh, you know, in great details later. So Helena asks her very innocuously and obviously very curiously that why would you marry someone like Jimmy? And the response to Alison is very, very interesting. And we see that uh, if, you, if you read the play, there's a certain section in the play which actually deals with this entire theme in, in great details. Now, Alison tells Helena that, you know, when we came back from India, everything seemed very vague. Everything seemed uh, very different. Uh, I felt very alienated. I could not connect to England. I could not connect to the people around us. Although we are racially English, we are ethnically English, we are linguistically English. But, you know, I grew up in India and when I came back to England after 1947, there's nothing I can connect to. So, looking at Jimmy Porter, and he describes his, her first meeting with Jimmy Porter as a very odd kind of a meeting where there was a party and Jimmy came in the party, uh, you know, driving a bicycle, uh, riding a bicycle rather, and, you know, uh, wearing a tuxedo with sweat dripping on him from all sides. So he, he represented this uh, figure of vitality, this figure of energy, wild, barbaric vitality, which attracted uh, Alison because, you know, she is so used to numbness at that point in time. She's sort of seen as numb characters around him, numb, vague characters who are as alienated as she is in a current setting of England. So in that kind of an alienated experience, suddenly there's this appearance of Jimmy Porter as this wild barbarian, this intellectual barbarian who can quote Shelley, who can quote Keats, who can quote Shakespeare, but at the same time has a working class heart. So he is this perfect combination which attracts Alison. So he is someone, uh, she is obviously very erotically attracted to him, uh, intellectually attracted to him, but of course that's a very romantic kind of an attraction and she falls for him, uh, quote unquote falls for him. So it's a very romantic kind of entanglement that she has with Jimmy. And again, this obviously uh, more than a gender question, it becomes very quickly a class question. So I mean, Alison Redfern belongs to a certain class. 
So she belongs to this upper middle class and she has this imperial family lineage. So she has been to India, she grew up in India, she's sort of used to being order, you know, obeyed, she's used to being waited upon, she's used to a sense of entitlement. So you know, she's used to some kind of circles. Now Jimmy Porter obviously comes from a completely different kind of background. He is working class, deeply working class. His father was a soldier uh, in, in a Spanish Civil War and that's all we know of him. Uh, his mother, we'd never get to know what his mother was except for the fact that she was fashionably, uh, you know, uh, for, the, for the good causes and she was not a very honest woman according to Jimmy. Uh, so he comes from a very working class background. You know, what that does, obviously, it brings the class question to the fore in look back in anger. So it's a very deeply class divided society, as you mentioned. So it's, it's gender as well as class coming into play in a very complex combination. Okay, so we have Alison Redfern, uh, who is obviously a woman uh, who grew up in India uh, in a very privileged, very wealthy, uh, in the sense of entitlement. Now she comes back to England and now she feels completely disconnected and vague and numbed by the people around her. And then she sees Jimmy Porter, uh, who is this intellectual barbarian who comes in and obviously uh, she's swept off her feet and then she falls for Jimmy and you know and obviously what happens immediately is that entire family of Alison uh, they go up in arms because they you know this, this is a class question coming in in a big way it's almost like you're marrying someone outside the class and it's an act of sacrilege uh, this is a very typically a class-based British society which doesn't want uh, the class structure to disappear and wants to protect it right at all costs so again uh, you know the woman becomes very, very important over here because the body of the woman, the figure of the woman is the vessel of hygiene, the vessel of uh, racial uh, class-based hygiene. So, you know, if the body of the woman travels outside the permissible parameter, so what happens is, uh, you know, there's a fear of contamination. There's a fear of, uh, you know, uh, in a pollution. There's a fear of being, you know, affected by a pollutant by someone who is not from that particular circle. So Jimmy Porter obviously uh, is looked at by Alison's mother, another very important figure, another very important female presence in the play, as some kind of a pollutant, as some kind of an invader uh, to their prestige, an invader to their class, an invader, a barbaric invader uh, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their class system. So he's someone who's feared by Alison's mother and she does her best to stop the marriage but of course the marriage does happen and then of course Alison moves away moves out of her father's house and stays with Jimmy but then very quickly realizes the the the, the, the darkness of this marriage and that she had fallen for a man uh, romantically but then of course this is more of a revenge for Jimmy as it turns out so marrying Alison is almost an act of revenge for Jimmy Porter because you know, this is a way of winning against an upper class you, you, you're marrying you're taking away a woman uh, you know as a, as a trophy wife in a way and that is a victory against that class so again you can see the the way the women are women appear and look back in anger they are hated they are someone who are feared but also in, interestingly they're also commodified so Alison in this particular play is essentially commodified. So she's this commodity, this class-based commodity that Jimmy wants to possess. So marrying Alison, in a way, interestingly, is an act of revenge uh, that is enacted by Jimmy Porter. And it's something Alison's father comes to realize later on. So when he asks, again, when he asks his daughter innocuously, uh, you know, why did someone like him marry you? So uh, one of the responses Alison gives to her father is that maybe it was an act of revenge. We're never sure, but perhaps it was an act of revenge. So again, uh, the, the body of the woman, the woman becomes a trophy in look back in anger. So she's someone who is to be possessed by the men. So she's someone who is to be protected by the men. So again, this becomes quite complex. And that, in that sense, the gender reconfigurations in look back in anger really uh, become quite complex uh, and complicated in the uh, entire idiom of the play. So uh, the woman in look back in anger include uh, obviously Alison uh, uh, Porter, Jimmy's wife, Alison Redfern. Uh, then there's Helena Charles and now Helena Charles is very important because Helena Charles is Alison's friend but more importantly as we get to see in the play the moment she appears the first the first identity that she has what we get to know of her in the play is that she is a professional actress so she's a stage actress she's come to London uh, to act in a particular play and she comes to Jimmy's house because apparently she doesn't have any place to live and so she Alison very kindly uh, invites her to stay at her place and then she moves into Jimmy's house, Jimmy and Alison's house. So she at the beginning represents or embodies this very middle class matriarchal presence. Someone who is authoritative, someone uh, who has a very clear idea of right and wrong. Someone who is very good looking but at the same time has this uh, you know, presence of authority which scares men away from her etc etc. But then of course as you see in the play, so she very quickly moves from a position of disgust to a position of desire. 
uh, when it comes to Jimmy. So at the beginning of the play, when she first appears in Look Back in Angle, we find her, at least ostensibly, uh, you know, uh, disgusted by Jimmy. So she is someone who finds Jimmy's presence appalling, disgusting. It's, it's an abuse uh, to her, you know, it's an abuse to her presence, it's an abuse to her sense of morality, uh, middle class morality. And Jimmy is obviously very sadistically, uh, you know, enjoys seeing Helena uncomfortable because Helena represents to him the, the middle class voice the pro-establishment middle class voice that he so abhors, that, uh, that he so loathes and hates uh, in the play. Now obviously what happens to look back in anger is quite complex because when Helena moves in, she persuades uh, you know, Alison uh, to move back into the establishment. So there's this very interesting scene in Look Back in Anger where, you know, again, the, the entire gender and class thing intermingle in that particular scheme where Helena persuades uh, Alison uh, to go to a church with her on a Sunday. And that is shocking to Jimmy because A, the woman going to the church obviously uh, is, is, you know, she, he's losing possession on the woman so they're moving away from him uh, and Helena obviously is instrumental uh, in his lack of possession that he has and his wife because Alison is someone, someone he wants to possess endlessly and of course the voice of the church, the presence of the church is a presence of establishment so it's the pro-establishment architecture and Jimmy uh, if anything he is someone who is supposed to be anti-establishment, someone who is supposed to be uh, you know, resentful of establishment. So in that sense, Look Back in Anger is a very complex play because of the way it situates establishment and anti-establishment and how the two play against each other in different kinds of combinations. Now, interestingly, as I just mentioned, Helena is someone who comes and is instrumental in breaking, you know, you know uh, Alison away from Jimmy and then he's also, she's also instrumental in, in, in sending Alison away because, you know, she writes a letter to Alison's father describing the appalling condition Alison is living in and of course Alison's father comes in to take the daughter away. But, interestingly, Helena does not leave with Alison, she stays back and then Jimmy comes back uh, from a funeral where, you know, Hugh, Hugh, mother's, uh, Hugh, Hugh Tanner's mother had died. But interestingly, what we see is Alison, uh, Helena, very quickly converting her disgust to desire. So suddenly, uh, you know, uh, she slaps Jimmy uh, after Jimmy says something abusive to her and then when Jimmy wants to hit her back but he cannot, uh, she drags Jimmy and the two of them start kissing passionately and she very quickly becomes Jimmy's mistress in the play, right? So again, from someone who hates Jimmy, so she suddenly becomes someone uh, who is sort of very, very uh, erotically attracted to Jimmy. Right? And that is a very important transition that happens in the play. And again, the class question comes in very interestingly in this uh, situation as well. This Jimmy represents uh, to these women, Helena and Alison, uh, this very attractive uh, other. And we talked about the other, if you remember, in Heart of Darkness, where the other, of course, was, uh, was Kutz's African mistress, whose name we never get to know because you know, she's an African, a non-white person who never speaks. So she's a perfect subaltern who doesn't speak but is just described in a very exotic kind of a description. However, the other in loop back in anger, interestingly, from the perspective of the two middle class women, is Jimmy Porter. So Jimmy Porter, interestingly, becomes the voice of the other. Jimmy Porter is the attraction of the other. So someone who is sort of, uh, you know, uh, educated, someone who has been uh, touched by education, touched by establishment, touched by academia. But again, at the heart, he's someone who's deeply working class. And it's a very interesting combination of education, sophistication. He can quote Shakespeare, he can quote Keats, he can quote Shelley and Wordsworth and everything. But at the same time, he's a barbarian, uh, you know, who is not really genteel. And this combination is attractive uh, to this middle class woman uh, who finds themselves erotic attractive, attracted to Jimmy Porter. So again, we find this combination of class and gender uh, in a very interesting play with each other in Look Back in Anger. So not only is it, is it a question, question of gender, not only are they attracted to Jimmy Porter because of what he is as a man, but also equally is, is a class question. And Jimmy, interestingly, you find he is somewhere uh, of a limbo and when it comes to the class location. So neither, as I mentioned a little while ago, neither is a purely working class, neither is he purely middle class. He can never be middle class because he never have the money to become middle class, but neither can he go back into being the pure working class because he has been sort of quote unquote affected or perhaps a better word would be corrupted by education by university education. So he can now not speak, he can, not, he can now not unlearn that what is learned in a university setting. He can now not speak in a working class accent. He can now not speak uh, in a working class dialect. He cannot have the working class perspective. His perspective now has been influenced by his reading of Shelley and Keats and Wordsworth and Shakespeare and his uh, awareness of the world around him. 
uh, of the politics around him, of the you know, political conditions around him, of the worldly affairs around him. So all his awareness has changed him essentially from being a passive working class barbarian. But at the same time, he is a very interesting combination of contradictions. This is something I mentioned at the beginning of the play, at the beginning of this lecture. And we will see when the play opens, when you, when you we'll read the first page of the Go Back in Anger, the first description of Jimmy Porter is, he is really a disconcerting mixture disconcerting. It will never really gel with each other. It will never really be a, a seamless mixture. It will always be a disconcerting mixture of honesty, sincerity, malice, freebooting cruelty, all together in asymmetric combinations. Right? And that's what makes the play, that's what makes the character so complex. Uh, Jimmy Porter as a character is so complex. He's never meant to be a hero. He's never really is a villain. He's somewhat of an anti-hero. You're not supposed to like him at all, but at the same time, you cannot hate him entirely because he has a certain sort of sympathy that he arouses in us as readers. Uh, and so we, we have this very grave perception, this very ambivalent perception, this very ambivalent attitude to Jimmy Porter, and that's something which makes this character so interesting and complex at the same time. Now, I just mentioned uh, this is in relation to the idea of gender and the idea of masculinity and femininity in Lubbock in Anger. Now, Jimmy Porter, uh, at the very beginning of the play, if you look at the stage directions, he is someone who is wearing a shattered, a shabby tweed jacket, right? He's smoking a pipe. He is wearing a shattered tweed jacket. He's sitting on an armchair. He's reading the news of the world. Now, all these uh, signifiers, all these very metonymic markers, tweed jacket, uh, a pipe, reading news of the world, uh, having tea, he has endless cups of tea. Now all these, mind you, none of these are really working class. All these are very, very uh, middle class markers of gentility, of you know, gentlemanly masculinity. So tweed jacket, again, uh, sartorially, the tweed jacket is a marker for middle class masculinity in Britain. Right? So we find there's a certain aspirational quotient in Jimmy, a certain aspirational quality in Jimmy Porter. He wants to be a certain kind of masculinity. Right? Now, but the, the, the irony is that a twig jacket he's wearing is very shabby. The pipe he's smoking is perhaps not very expensive. Uh, the armchair he's resting on is a very shabby armchair. Right? Uh, and his, the trousers he's wearing are very, very creased, not, not very you know, ironed well. So, you know, again, he has this aspirational quality. He wants to be a certain kind of masculinity. He wants to aspire to become the gentleman. But then, of course, the markers he's using uh, are insufficient markers. Now, so on the one hand, he is someone who hates middle class. He is someone who abhors middle class masculinity. Like, you know, he, he cannot stand Nigel. Uh, he has all cynicism for Colonel Redfern, Alison's father. But at the same time, he cannot go back and be a purely working class man either. There is a section in Look Back in Anger, the very beginning of the play, where it's a Sunday, uh, and Cliff proposes to Jimmy and Alison that they go out and watch a movie. I don't know, they're playing a new Sunday movie, and he says, let's go out and watch a film in the theater. And to which Jimmy's response is very interesting. He says, I don't want my Sunday evening to be destroyed by the front row yops. Y O B S the front row yops in the theatre. Now what does the word yob mean? Y or B S? So yops over here means this uneducated, unemployed, working class men, working class boys and men. So they are very derogatorily called yobs. Then the word yob, Y or B S, uh, you know, is something used is a word used by the gentlemen, the privileged people, the wealthy people who look down upon those kind of men and boys who they feel are the pollutants of society, who they feel are people who are no good, people who are unemployed, people who are nuisance, really. They cause nuisance. Now, this is exactly the rhetoric Jimmy is using. So that essentially really reveals to us as readers the very ambivalent, complex contradiction that is always operating, operative in Jimmy Porter. So on the one hand, he, is, he has all his hatred against the middle class. He hates the middle class, the privilege, the entitlement, you know, the sense of you know, ownership, on knowledge, on, 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 on economy, on culture, etc. But on the same side, on the same hand, on the other hand, sorry, he's someone who will not mix with the yops will not mix with what is a pure working class people. So again, we find him somewhere in a limbo state between being a working class and being a middle class. So in a sense, we can read his masculinity as a limbo, liminal masculinity. It's very performative. So he's someone who's trying to perform the role of a gentleman. He's someone who's quoting Shakespeare, someone who's quoting Wordsworth, someone who's quoting uh, you know, uh, Shelley all the time. He wants to be this Shelleyan kind of a figure, this rebel with a great cause, you know, this masculinist. Uh, you know, image of rebellion, subversion, anti-establishment, etc. But at the same time, he doesn't really want to be uh, a part of the real working class crowd either. 
So in that sense, it's a very complex play. And interestingly, Jimmy's relationship with uh, Alison's father, Colonel Redfern, is also very, very interesting. Because Colonel Redfern, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, in a previous lecture perhaps, that he is someone who uh, no, who's spent 30 years of his life in India uh, commanding a Maharaja's army. So he was in charge of an Indian emperor's army, an Indian king's perhaps, a princely state uh, army uh, that he was commanding. So his idea of life is very rosy, romantic. Uh, he's very used to authority, very used to being waited upon, uh, very used to being obeyed, uh, very used to being non-questioned, etc. So he, he's sort of completely used to that kind of masculinity. So he represents the very privileged, hegemonic, white, imperial masculinity, which now is defunct which now is on its way out. So again, this is a very interesting example of how a certain kind of hegemonic gender identity can change to a certain political condition. So again, look at the way in which this entire psychology of embodiment, what you feel to be as a person can change by certain external uh, events like imperialism, death of imperialism, a war, a end of a war, uh, a, a change in government, etc. So again, what we find in colonial Redfern is a shift from solidity to fragility. And this is something, this is a phrase, if you remember, which we used in a previous lecture, the last lecture we had on Catherine Mansfield's fly, where we looked at the boss, the figure of the boss in Mansfield's fly, as someone who ships, uh, has this transition, this very painful transition from a position of solidity to a position of, uh, you know, you know, fragility or weakness, etc. And it's exactly what happens in Colonel Redfern, in Lubbock, in Anger. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, Jimmy has a sense of empathy for the colonel. So he is someone who looks at the colonel and almost pities him and tells Alison at some point that, you know, at least your father had a certain kind of a rosy life at some point. Now, obviously, that, that is complete nonsense. That was a construct of a, you know, diseased imagination, a very Eurocentric imagination with this supposed idea of superiority, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, we all know there was a fairy tale which was a, a myth of superiority, a power of supremacy, etc. But at least he had something for a period of time. And now he, he's obviously, he's got the luxury of nostalgia to look back at it with fondness, right? Now with Jimmy, he doesn't have that. He never had anything, right? So all his life had been miserable. Uh, he's been, he's, he is aspiring to be a gentleman. He has been to university, he has gotten himself educated, but then of course, nothing has changed in his life and he finds himself in a position of you know, depravity, uh, you know, so working as a sweet stall vendor in an open air market. So he, on the one hand, is envious of someone like Colonel Redfern for the right reasons. So then Redfern, people who enjoyed privilege, people who really had positions of power, authority uh, at some imperial condition at some point in time. But equally, interestingly, he also has a sense of uh, empathy for this person because he realizes uh, how it must feel for someone like Redfern to move away from the position of privilege to a position of poverty. Right, the position of gender poverty, cultural poverty, because this is an England which doesn't recognize him as unquestionable, which doesn't recognize him as authoritative, which actually questions his authority increasingly. And he's sort of completely puzzled by it, Redfern. He doesn't know why his authority is being increasingly questioned uh, in this kind of a setting. Right? So again, we have this very interesting gender dynamic between uh, you know, Jimmy and Redfern, Nigel, Hugh Tan, there's all these men around Jimmy Porter. And then, of course, there is Cliff, Cliff Lewis. So Cliff Lewis is a friend of Jimmy Porter who stays, interestingly, with Jimmy and his wife, Alison. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, Cliff's relationship with Jimmy's wife is very, very ambivalent, is very complex. We're never sure whether it's erotic, whether it's, uh, you know, a sibling-like love, love that they share. It's never, it's never really clearly defined. It sort of slips into each other, uh, into different dimensions at different points of time. Now, Cliff Lewis, of course, is a purely working-class person. Cliff Lewis has not been to university. Cliff Lewis is very contented, uh, you know, running a sweet stall with Jimmy Porter because he doesn't have any other aspiration, doesn't want to be a gentleman. He hasn't been affected or corrupted by education as such. So he's just been a purely working class person. And if you watch the film, Look Back in Anger, which is a lovely film directed by Tony Richardson, which was made in 1959, four years after, three years after the play was published first, or performed first. It's a play, it's a film which starts Richard Burton as uh, you know, as Jimmy Porter, but the character of Cliff, played by the actor, has a very strong Welsh accent. Now, again, uh, accent in Lubbock in Anger is very, very important because you know, accent is a very important thing in relation to class. 
in Britain because a Welsh accent in Britain obviously is a signifier of not a very good class. So if you have a very strong prominent Welsh accent, uh, a non-British accent, well, that sort of betrays your class, that reveals that you're not really uh, upper middle class, you're not really educated, you don't really have a posh accent. You know, Jimmy Porter's accent obviously is very, very posh. So again, that is an accent he must have picked up when he went to university. So again, these are the markers of prestige, privilege uh, in the same kind of a masculinity map that is there. And of course, the woman in Lubbock in Anger, the, 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 the four women who either appear or are talked about in Lubbock in Anger, uh, Jimmy's wife, Alison, Helena Charles, both of them are very middle class, both of them are obviously educated. Uh, Helena is someone who is a professional actress. And we'll talk a little bit more about Helena later in another later lecture because she is someone who is a professional actress. So she is, essentially, she's acting within this play. So it's a play within a play that she does at different points of time. So we're never quite sure what, to what extent uh, is a desire for Jimmy genuine. We're never quite sure whether this is a performative thing she's doing out of an impulse of desire, out of an impulse of lust that she has for Jimmy. Uh, you know, because when Alison comes back at the end of the play, uh, Helena very readily packs her bags and leaves because she suddenly realizes what she had done is morally wrong. So when Alison comes back at the end of the play, uh, Helena essentially, uh, you know, uh, you know, connects back to her middle class self and realizes that she had done something morally wrong and so she leaves, uh, you know, without a word. So the, the obvious question that we have as readers and audiences in the play is that to what extent is Alison's love for Jimmy genuine? <clears throat> uh, to what extent is Helena's love for Jimmy genuine? Because she becomes the mistress of Jimmy and they have a very, obviously, a very erotic relationship, but that is a relationship which may have been performative on the perspective, on the part of Helena because, you know, when the moment the rightful wife comes back, she becomes, she returns to this middle class woman's position, uh, she returns to this position of right and wrong, uh, sinful and virtuosity, and then she goes back to her middle class privilege. Uh, you know, having spent some time as Jimmy's mistress, as a non-middle class woman uh, in an interim period. So again, this begs the question uh, about performativity. Uh, to, what kind of woman is she performing at that point in time? So again, you know, even within the woman, even within the man, the different kinds of performances which are being endlessly produced and reproduced and look back in anger. So Jimmy, the working class man, is performing, uh, you know, the middle class man's rhetoric, true rhetoric, true dress, true embodiment. He wants to become that. There's this aspirational quality that he has as a result of which he's wearing a tweed jacket, smoking a pipe, drinking tea, uh, reading the Financial Times, or the News of the World, etc. And he's quoting Shakespeare, he's constantly aware of showing, um, exhibiting his awareness of world politics, etc. So all this come together to make him very, very switched on about what is happening around him. And that is obviously very, very uh, aspirational and doesn't want to be seen as a, as a, as a lower class, as a working class person at all. Okay? So likewise, uh, you know, Alison, Jimmy's wife, who obviously comes from a middle class background, so she is someone who wants to fit into this kind of a limbo zone between working class and middle class, but struggles doing it. And Helena, more complexly, who appears in a play as uh, a performing actress, uh, performs the role of Jimmy's mistress for a point of time before going back again uh, into being a middle class woman. Now the other characters, the other female characters in Look Back in Anger include uh, Jimmy's uh, mother-in-law, uh, Mrs. Redfern, Alison's mother who obviously embodies the voice of middle class matriarchy, the voice of middle class uh, you know, anxiety uh, against you know, this unhygienic presence that Jimmy Porter embodies. Uh, so she is a voice of middle class hygiene, the middle class sense of hygiene, the fear of contamination, the fear of pollution, etc. We get to know about her from the different descriptions we get about her, from Jimmy, from Alison, from other people, etc. We get to know in the course of the play that she was someone who hired private detectives to you know, find out about Jimmy when she found out that Jimmy is about to marry her daughter. So she hired people to spy on Jimmy. She hired detectives to spy on Jimmy to find out more about his moral character, about his emotional character, etc. So she is someone who completely embodies, who clinically embodies this position of middle class matriarchy that Jimmy abhors. So she is completely pro-establishment. She is someone uh, who is uh, protective of her establishment, protective of her class. So she is someone who completely discourages and is, is absolutely refuses to let her uh, daughter marry someone like Jimmy to the point that when she actually marries Jimmy Porter, she makes everything, she makes Alison sign everything, all her inheritance sign back to her because you know, she doesn't want the property to get out of the system. 
And again, this is a classic case of the anxiety of a certain kind of privileged community to keep the money within the privileged community, to keep the resources, to keep the privilege within the privileged community. So she doesn't want, Alice's mother doesn't want Jimmy to get any of the privilege that they had acquired over the years as an imperial family, as someone who's been to India, come back with the capital, with that imperial capital. She doesn't want any of that to get out of the system at all. And of course, the son, Nigel Redfern, is an embodiment of the privilege, an embodiment of the entitlement that comes to the privilege. So Alison's mother is a very important female presence in the place. So she's someone Jimmy absolutely abhors. And the kind of rhetoric she, he uses to describe Alison's mother is a vitriolic rhetoric. It's a rhetoric of rage, of disgust. It's a sickly kind of description where he compares her, uh, you know, to a sickly organism which is being fed uh, by, which is being eaten by ants. It's a very sickly kind of a description, very gory, very graphic, which is obviously reveals the mind that he has, reveals the attitude, the emotion that he has of fear, disgust, aversion to this kind of a female presence. Okay. So she is another very important figure. Now, Al Jimmy's mother, of course, never appears in the play like Alison's mother, where he's, she's talked about very briefly in the play. And we get to know that she is someone who Jimmy hates as well because he considers her to be uh, someone who is all for the causes of minorities, provided they are fashionable minorities. Right? So she is someone who is very fashionably left wing, very fashionably uh, you know, for good causes. Someone who has no time for his dying husband who went to the Spanish Civil War and came back broken and decadent, but she would probably go out and do charities which would make her look fashionable. And that's the reason why Jimmy hates her, and although we never get to know more about her, we know almost nothing about her in the course of this play. Now the other character, the other female character in Loop Back in Anger who appears, uh, again doesn't appear, but it's talked about extensively, is Hugh Tanner's mother, Ma Tanner or Mrs. Tanner. Now Mrs. Tanner is the only woman that Jimmy likes. Uh, he really loves her and she is this perfect motherly presence, this perfect motherly figure for Jimmy. Uh, so she's someone who starts him with the sweet stall, who invests, who gives him the capital presumably to open the sweet stall in the market and she represents the pure working class woman. Uh, someone that Alison cannot connect to. Alison considers her to be ignorant, to be plain, to be artless, to be unsophisticated uh, and because Alison is speaking from a position of privilege. So Alison talks about uh, Mrs. Tanner to Helena and the two of them discuss how ignorant uh, the woman is because she is so working class, she knows nothing about nothing, about anything. Uh, so you know, in that sense, uh, she sort of mocks um, you know, Mrs. Tanner to a great extent. Now again, mind you, Mrs. Tanner's son, Hugh Tanner, has been to university, so he can take on people like Alison and give back to them using the rhetoric of education, the vocabulary, the metaphors of education and class and culture. He can do all that. But she has never been to university, so she's a pure working class woman the, whom these people can mock endlessly. So you can see the class question and the gender question intermingling so complexly in Look Back in Anger. So Mrs. Tanner represents the pure working class. Interestingly, Jimmy uh, loves her to the extent that he considers her to be this motherly presence uh, and uh, obviously she dies in the course of the play and her death is a very symbolic death. One may read her death as a death of the pure working class. So there's no pure working class left after Mrs. Tanner of course because the working class have been contaminated by education, contaminated by culture, access to culture and they end up being monsters like Jimmy and Hugh Tanner uh, who end up being nothing, neither working class nor middle class. Okay, so Mrs. Tanner is another very important female presence in the play, something that we'll explore in due course of time. So just giving you an overview of the characters in Look Back in Anger, I've given you uh, an overview of the gendered idea of emotions and moods and effect in Look Back in Anger. And obviously one of the things which we'll do in this particular course is look at the gendered quality, not just of human living entities, but also non-human, non-living entities like the River Congo, like the mood of despair, like the mood of anger. So these things are very, very gendered as well. You know, they, they take up gendered readings. They're either they're very male or they're very female. They're exoticized, they're domesticated. Uh, you know, alternatively, uh, you know, they become uh, phallic metaphors, they become you know, passive metaphors. So again, we are, we, one of the things which we'll do, we should do in this particular course is to decode the gendered uh, underpinnings of non-living entities such as the rivers, such as moods, such as emotions, 
such as political landscape uh, and such as other non-living entities as well. So, you know, this particular lecture has tried to give you an idea of the characters and a theatrical significance of Lubak in Anger, characters who appear directly, don't appear directly, but are talked about endlessly with other characters. Uh, to what extent are they important politically? To what extent are they important theatrically uh, in this particular play? And that is something which will take up, obviously, for the next lecture, which we'll have in Lubak in Anger. We'll move on to the text, we'll look at certain selected passages, especially the opening of Lubak in Anger, and that will sort of replay what we just told, talked about in terms of Jimmy's aspiration to become a gentleman, to become a uh, you know, again, see, even within this male identity that he has, how the male identity is subdivided into you know, different kinds of identities. He wants to be just a gentle, manly man. So he's smoking a pipe, wearing a shabby tweed jacket, uh, you know, which is torn at the edges, uh, you know, sitting in an armchair, uh, which is also torn, drinking tea, a very colonial drink, a very imperial drink, reading the Financial Times, reading the news of the world, commenting on world politics, commenting on culture. So all these taken together, metonymically they sort of construct him or at least aspire to construct him as a gentleman as this European English Edwardian gentleman which he wants to embody right despite his background he's a very working class background but he aspires to become that kind of a male that model of masculinity which is something he wants to embody but of course he cannot embody because he doesn't have the real thing which is the financial capital he has the intellectual capital the cultural capital because he's been to university but he needs more than that to be a purely middle class person and equally he cannot go back to being the working class man either purely because you know he's been corrupted by education to a great extent and apropos of this conundrum that Jimmy Porter is we have this middle class and working class woman around him who basically uh, help us and understand the psychology of Jimmy, uh, his aversion to women, his misogyny, his hatred, his fear of the woman. And obviously that fear comes from certain psychological reasons, certain neurotic reasons, certain political reasons, uh, and which we'll explore as we move on in this particular text, with this particular text. So I hope you uh, have a sort of a picture of the play. I hope you have an overview of the characters in Lubak in Anger. I do encourage you to start reading the play. Uh, it's a very important play politically, uh, even in the history of theatre. It's a very significant play because as I mentioned, it ushered in a new movement called the Angry Young Men Movement. And also this entire idea of kitchen sink drama. It's very gritty realism which is prevalent in Lubak in Anger, which makes it a really interesting play, uh, even in the context of our times. So I do hope to see you again in the next lecture, which will be a continuation of this play, Look Back in Anger by John Osborne. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you soon.